Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another uh, fun evening of uh, chatting with a comic artist this time. I mean, last night we had that uh, wonderful show with the daughters of Neil Adams. That was a lot of fun. It was a marathon, and I promise you, we are not going to be going till 1230 Eastern tonight. It's uh, not one of those kind of shows, but uh, tonight I've got artist Sean Gordon Murphy joining me tonight, and I'm not going to leave him sitting around too long in the green room. We'll bring him in right away. Hey, Sean, how's hey, it man. going? Good. Good to see you. We, we bumped uh, into each other briefly at San Diego and I got to see you uh, in person for the first time. So that was good. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody, when they first meet me, they, they think I'm taller than I am. But you were actually, I think, taller than I was. So that's probably. <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> Let's everybody, just say we're, we're both men of great stature. Let's just exactly. Put it exactly. It was, it, was, it was funny. The first time we went to uh, I went to Heroes. Right. And I met so many people that I've been you know talking to for the last yeah. two years through the live stream and everybody was like, gosh, you're taller than I thought. Like, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm only four foot five or something here because I'm sitting down <laughs> all day. You're so tiny on my screen. I thought you were yeah, exactly. short in person. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm the uh, tallest guy I've met in comics, I think might be Tim Townsend, who oh my is gosh, uh, yeah. an anchor. He's like a linebacker. He belongs behind a, a barbecue in his backyard. Like, he doesn't look like a comic book guy at all. He looks like he should be tackling somebody. And when I met him, he was drunk, and he picked me up by my nipples from behind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's very few people that I mean, I'm only six one, but still, it's generally tall for for comics folks. And there's not many people that can pick me up like that. And he did. And um, I did it back to him and I accidentally ripped the cross off his neck and I felt really bad. Like, you know, maybe I was going to send him to hell or something. And his right. wife's like, no, you're fine. He deserves it. He shouldn't be picking people up like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, he yeah. Has, he, he's not been uh, properly house trained. <laughs> no. Yeah. I think he'd be the first to agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, he. Uh, I think he's in Melbourne, Florida. I mean, I've known Tim for a long time. He, he's he's a lot of fun, but uh, he's never picked me up by my name. Not yet. Yeah, who <laughs> says comics is an unsafe place for women? He did invite me to his house. Now. now I have to be on guard because you know he's only a few hours away from me now. Yeah, well, that's the beauty of MegaCon. At least it used to be. He used to throw. Uh, I think um, back in the day uh marvel or somebody used to just send him a check and say here buy some food whatever have a party on us at your house so we would all pile in a car and go to tim's and um in 2000 the year 2000 actually was when i first met him because i was just some kid from college and i knew i shouldn't be at that party but i ended up getting in and uh yeah he was really good to me and everyone had a good time and everything yeah, no, no, Tim's awesome. I look forward yeah. to it. He told me the same thing. He's like, look me up whenever you're down, uh, you know, towards Melbourne. I, you it's know, worth it. I mean, his collection's crazy. His original yeah. art stuff, He's he had a Joe Mad hanging in his foyer. I was just staring at it for an hour. And uh, he had a bunch of old Mignola stuff, like 80s bubbly Mignola back before he was uh, Hellboy. And uh, yeah, Tim's been collecting a long time. I think he even like financed a couple of his cars just by selling original art. Uh, my impression is he doesn't need to work anymore with the art that he has, but obviously he still does work. Yeah. You know, I, I saw him at uh, the MegaCon in, I think it was May. And I guess he's sort of kind of transitioning out of being an art collector, even though I know he has a lot of great art still. He's yeah. slowly been, he's been selling a few pieces here and there. Just it's, he doesn't have the fire that he used to have. When I, when I met him, uh, you know, online back around 2000, 2001, when I was originally collecting, Tim was, uh, he, he was just, he was an animal getting artwork. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if a piece of, of art would pop up on eBay. He would yeah. make an offer to the seller immediately and get it taken off eBay and buy it before any other collector had the chance to get it. I mean, wow. I, I remember him picking up. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. One of the coolest things was some. It was a. It was a. Uh, it was some kind of a cover by John Byrne, but it had Alpha Flight on it. But it, it wasn't an Alpha Flight cover. It might have been like a, you know, like a comics reader cover, something like that, or maybe a comics yeah. journal cover. But it was gorgeous, and I and I just remember yeah. him like. You know, here's it. You know, he would always wear that badge, you know, of honor. Like he'd be like, "Here it is, right here. I got it again, and I got it before anybody else could get it." And we would all sit there, like, you know, we'd be mad, but we'd be <laughs> amazed at the same time that he was able to do that. Yeah, I have a buyer who uh, will swoop in, and if my other buyers know he's going to bid, they'll just back off. And um, there's no way to control it, um, mm -hmm. but it sort of means this guy might actually get a decent price because he's bought his way to the top so to speak and he's scaring the shit out of everybody right so uh whereas if you have two or three buyers bidding obviously the numbers can go higher but if he's the only one there because everyone else is terrified you know but hey he still spends a lot so well does he let everybody know which pieces he's interested in that might be his strategy now is to to get the word yeah out. that might be his uh oh that's a good one maybe that's what he's thinking 
I don't know yeah. if I was him. That's what I and, and I knew that that would work. I would probably be telling everybody, you know, however <laughs> I could, at least telling the right people who have very loose lips that mm. you know these are the pieces I'm going for. Yeah, there must be. Uh, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about them, but there must be like kind of a uh, mercenary tactics that buyers use. Um, oh my gosh, to, to there, screw with each other. <laughs> there are many, many, you know, what the yeah, <laughs> tactics out there, and there, you know, and there's lots of groups of collectors that help each other as well. You know, like you know, I'm going for this one, lay off it, and uh, right. or that find other things. You know, if I if I'm passing on a piece, they let somebody else know about it. So, yeah. so there's uh there's a lot of that going on, and then as far as just like saving money, there mm. was uh, I was talking with a collector yesterday about uh, you know just about some stuff. And they mentioned to me this this way of of uh, saving money with heritage, which I had never would have even considered. Was I guess if you you know we were talking about people who drop ship their artwork because they're in a foreign country, right? So they have those there's those services out there like in Delaware or mm -hmm. whatever where you, you can just have all of your eBay purchases go there, and then when you get enough stuff, they'll ship it to you. And, you know, in Europe and at a, at a mm -hmm. flat fee, so you save money on shipping. Right. Well, savvy art collectors who buy very expensive artwork. Apparently, uh, because of the the tax situation in, in Delaware or wherever this place is, yeah, it's you don't get state. charged any sales tax. So, so yeah. guys who are spending large amounts of money with Heritage are having the artwork shipped to the holding company, then the holding yeah. company ships it to them. They pay no sales tax. Yeah. So there's there's many angles that are being played, you know, mm -hmm. throughout all probably all collectibles to save money, and that that I just I love we'll it. never be aware of. Yeah. How many, do you know any collectors with uh, uh, accounts in the Cayman Islands or anything like that? <laughs> I was emailing. There was a guy who paid his premium membership yesterday as well. And uh, <laughs> and I saw, I, I, I've been, now that I'm in Florida, I've been thinking about doing get togethers there. So I kind of scan the mailing address of the premium payments when they come in. And I saw this guy was uh, an hour away. So I, I, you know, I thanked him for his uh, renewing and, and I said, Hey, I'm in Florida now. Mm -hmm. If you want to get, you know, I'm thinking of doing a get together in the fall, blah, blah, blah. And he said, Oh, I can't. I'm in the Cayman Islands. I just mm, used this yeah. address over there for my U.S. credit card and blah blah blah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think yeah. there's a lot of collectors. You're there. you're you're hitting the uh, handful of one percenters that uh, have way too much money. <laughs> right. You're like and, Saudi and princes. And... I never will have it. I'm not that savvy. Yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, they have fuck you money is what they would call it, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I had a uh, event once in New York. Uh, I won't name the hotel and I won't name the the art dealer that did this. Uh, it's kind of related to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I had an event in the hotel. I got the uh, suite. I rented it out and I did an, an auction. This is when um, White Knight issue one art was first available. And um, we had stuff like taped to the windows, you know, skyscrapers, 31st floor, wherever we were. We had this sort of bougie. Uh, we attempted some kind of bougie party. We wanted to have hors d'oeuvres and wine and because I was organizing it, I, I fucked it up and got the dates wrong. So anyway, we're scrambling to throw this thing together and all of the invited people start coming by and they all have like a special button or something uh, to get in. And um, one of the big art dealers um, who represents a lot of artists, I won't say his name, but you know him, uh, he caught wind of this and he was either annoyed that he wasn't invited or just annoyed that I was taking buyers away from him I don't know if he was planning some kind night. of dinner dinner right. that night. And I had no idea. And if I had known, I would have invited him too. Like, I'm not trying to, to, to snake anybody out of sales. So two of my buyers came up the hallway in the elevator and this guy ran into them and he's like giving them shit. Like, you don't think I know where you're going? You don't need to lie to me. You're going to Sean's party, aren't you? Like he was, <laughs> I thought he was screwing with them and he was seriously uh, pissed off. So the security manager that helped us at this hotel get, free rooms and help this collector get free rooms or this art dealer. Uh, he was so pissed off that that art dealer did that, that he refused to give him any free rooms for any of his artists the next year. Uh, and I don't know if this dealer is aware that he got dinged like that. You know, <laughs> I mean, if you're an art, an artist and you have, you're working with a, a, a rep and this rep talks shit and, does something stupid and then you lose all your free hotel rooms at new york comic-con the next year i mean i'd be upset as an artist and uh that's the kind of thing that happened <laughs> right right so a few people are probably going to be able to figure out who i'm talking about but i'll tell you once we're off the air all right 
Well, you know, the thing is, that's the trouble. So, so many people don't do a great job maybe publicizing get these kind of get-togethers. And when you're at cons, I mean, you're right. Yeah. It, there's an, a show, a, a, an auction event like what you were doing is going to draw mm -hmm. a lot of sellers away. But if you knew somebody was doing something on this night or that night, you might try to try to yeah. wiggle around. But it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I see this all the time in the hobby. People don't even let me know. To, to kind of publicize that these events are happening and and yeah. I, and I usually run into them or come, hear about them by surprise you know that oh right. this is going to be happening tonight I'm like how could you not let me know you know this is something that a lot of people would want to participate in right. and uh and yeah so it just doesn't surprise me but I could see somebody you know yeah. I could see I could see several <laughs> oh know, yeah getting mad about <laughs> something like that if so I you had a good you, but I imagine I, your auction went well right yeah I did we so that was the first time I priced my Batman pages and I went really high. Like I, I'd only sold pages on average for like six or 800 bucks a page before then. But I knew since I was writing and drawing my own Batman book and I was hoping it would be a hit, I, I tripled my prices because I just thought of, I just had a, a hunch that they could sell and they ended up selling pretty well. I think we made like 40 K that night or something. And then some of the buyers had proxies there. So mm -hmm. you had people on the phone with someone else and, you know, some guy from France and someone from Brazil was buying and it was hard to keep track of, of who was. And we did really well. I was really glad because I was worried that my prices were way too high uh, and they were actually set just just right. And even people that started like reselling that stuff six months later were able to make a profit, which makes me happy. Like I actually want my people to make some money. I don't want sure. I want a healthy uh, market with my stuff. I don't want it to plummet, you know, a month from now and scare everybody away. No, that's uh, I mean, that's pretty smart. Well, it's it was smart just having that the event alone, oh, right? Uh, I don't know if any artists have ever done that with a new set of pages. I'm sure there have been, but I hadn't heard of anybody doing it for a long time, especially if you're like writing and drawing your own stuff on a, a big event like that. Like it would be like Paul Pope doing it or Mike Mignola or Daniel Warren Johnson. I mean, the mm -hmm. people that write and draw their own stuff at that level, you can count on one hand and who who is going to set up an event like that. So I don't know. I mean, you might know of other events like this that. Um, no, I mean, yeah. I really had not heard of anything quite like that before. Yeah. You know, where you went to that extent. Uh, you know, I've I've heard of you know renting spaces out, but not for yeah. an auction. Not 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 so high profile that they people would actually send proxies in their yeah. place, uh, You know, to <laughs> bid on things that that that's pretty unheard yeah. of as far as I I know. One guy sent a proxy who who had a stutter, uh, like I don't know if you call it a medical condition, but he also didn't speak English very well. And I don't know if he was aware that this person he had had this uh, this problem, but trying to he's on the phone translating it from Portuguese to English. He has a stutter and he's nervous because he's trying to help his client spend ten thousand dollars on something. And there's other mm -hmm. people bidding at the same time. And this this poor guy, I, <laughs> I mean, he ended up getting his client what he wanted. But I was really worried. This That's not a variable I, I foresaw happening, right. you know. Like you do an event like this, you try to think, all right, I need wine, I need hors d'oeuvres, I need music. What else do I need to make everybody feel comfortable? I never thought there would be a proxy there with a with a stutter that would be really hard to understand him, you know. But I guess it seemed to work out. Well, as long as he he got his client what uh, what they were after, then that's the good yeah. thing. But yeah, I can see how that could be a little uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> man but uh but no that's that's very that's i, I don't know i think that's a, that's a great idea so this because when we talked six months ago that was right when uh issue one was was coming out i think yeah right? I think yeah she moves at... out i'm glad to do this again with you um i just finished up uh issue six artwork mm -hmm. um i had my assistant send you some stuff with new pages that's available and uh yeah i'm not here to sell art or anything um but i am always just here to talk about the hobby and sort of show the new stuff that I'm bringing out and also to let people know that issue five is going to be coming out soon. Um, yeah. So, Oh, also I saw that my assistant's name was on the uh, credits. I don't think he's going to be making it. I think it's just you and me. Oh, okay. I thought he told me he was going to be showing up tonight. Well, that's uh, oh, yeah. all right. <laughs> I checked with him. He said he had a late day at work, so he's not going to make it. And he didn't right. feel like he was that useful last time anyway. So he's happy <laughs> to just bow out. <laughs> It's you know to me that that's fine. I I always want to keep everybody happy. Sometimes uh, yeah, you know, they'd like to have the handler friend there or not. But uh, nice. well, that's cool. Um, see, I've kind of lost my well. You know, so when we saw each other at at San Diego, I remember that we were talking with Morger, and you know, and 
everybody's been concerned about art prices and those sorts of things. And I'm sure, you know, most artists are, are concerned about it as well. We're, and we're going to be doing, you know, Heritage has had a very big signature auction uh, this past weekend, Thursday through Sunday. And, uh, and we're doing a recap on Thursday of some of the results from that. And I was going through doing my, we, we were, everybody who comes into that is picking like 15 pieces to talk about. So I thought we usually look at the most expensive stuff, but I decided to look at the lower end pieces. Nice. Sure. And, you know, on lower end being anything under 20, 20 to 20 to two. And the mm -hmm. interesting thing I saw was that, uh, you know, pieces by Adam Hughes, for instance, that had were from either 20, 2021 or 2022 actually sold for more than they originally bought. Just kind of like what you were oh, saying. Good. Good. I mean, there was a Jay Lee uh, cover that uh, was from last year. Um, and I know I'm forgetting the title, uh, but it sold for twenty two thousand dollars. Yeah. And so and so these are newer pieces of art that are still commanding, you know, yeah. uh, really a quality price, whereas other yeah. pieces around that uh, range may maybe dropped a little or went under the yeah, radar yeah. to some collectors. So I thought that was a you know, it's a good sign because I've always talked about it's always being better to be the second buyer in a, in a, in a new piece of art, because typically, right. you know, you're going to get a deal when that uh, first buyer has to flip it. You know, and I could think of. Yeah. You know, I won't name names either, but you know, there's a couple of high profile cover <laughs> artists that, you know, whose work sells for a premium. And if you yeah. were to try to try to sell it to another collector within the first year, you're probably going to get 10% yeah. less than you, than you paid for it. Yeah. And that's not that bad of a hit on, I mean, for years, I feel like comic book pages were $40 to $300. And when you bought it, you knew you could never get 50% 50, 50 of it back. You just mm -hmm. you bought it because you liked it and you wanted to own it. The idea of buying and having it grow like this is sort of new. And um, the names you're talking about, those are the marquee names. So there are more expensive buy-in for those names, but generally the art will uh, retain value if not grow. But I'm sure there's a you know, hundred artists that are putting out interiors every month that we don't know and their stuff might go for cheap and sell for even cheaper. So yeah, it's hard to know like where the, where to put the bell curve on this and as far as investments and stuff are concerned, but I'm just glad that the marquee names are still selling. If you're going to be spending uh, as much as you are in a Jay Lee or Adam Hughes or a page of mine, like hopefully you'd be uh, satisfied with your investment. And right. when it came time to let it go, you could break even or make a little bit of money on it, you know? Oh yeah, no, I, I agree. But it was good. It was good to see that because I I was starting yeah. to think that you know maybe we were going to see a, a downturn, and maybe we still will. I mean, I you know I keep yeah. hearing about some some people who are uh, you know like Steve Morgers. When we when we talked with Steve, Steve was of the opinion that right. we we're going to see a downturn in in pricing, and uh, you know I still don't think we've seen it. That, yeah. When I'm looking at the overall numbers for this auction from Heritage, the the per price per item price average did drop considerably mm -hmm. but the quality of the artwork in the in this auction wasn't as good as say the last three you know there yeah. wasn't a there wasn't a piece that sold for more than two million dollars like yeah, there was okay. in the last two uh, auctions and that does help to skew yeah. things and kind of yeah. make their overall sales look better but yeah uh That's i think only time will tell right <laughs> yeah no I, I love talking about this stuff and uh i it's funny i heard um you know you had the image boom in the 90s where it was uh the prospector market was coming in and buying multiple copies of spawn number one right the prospector market now might be comic book art like art from adam hughes jay lee like maybe we'll look back in 10 years and think oh we made the same mistake image did where people went a little crazy for this stuff and then when they tried to sell it all at once it went away but i don't think it's like that at all i think it's um i mean buying a bunch of spawn number ones thinking your kids are going to go to college when everyone else is buying them. I mean, that's just stupid. <laughs> right, right. We're still dealing with a one of a kind with the original. Exactly. Art. That's why I, I don't see it, yeah. it happening. You know, it's just, but, I just. Yeah, one of a kind. You have half the artists don't even do uh, traditional art anymore. So you've mm -hmm. got less being produced, which is, I guess, a good thing to protect the art that's still coming out. I mean, not to be mercenary, but when I meet someone and they're thinking about being traditional or uh, digital, I go, you should definitely go digital. <laughs> and they're like, why? And I go, because I don't want you competing. I don't want you getting good and competing with my sales. <laughs> <laughs> See, just like the uh, the buyer who who's trying yeah. to steer his, <laughs> his auction uh, competitors away. You know, you, exactly. You, you're steering <laughs> them out. It, it's all part of the game. <laughs> well, you know, but but the, the younger guys don't know any better, and that's you know, we, and we talk about that a lot in the hobby today because newer collectors, you know, they don't they don't know what it was like five years ago. To them, yeah. that, these prices that they're seeing today are are the norm. 
you know, whereas yeah. uh, those of us who've been around for, you know, five years, you know, seeing everything double or 20 years, seeing everything go up 10, 20, 30, yeah. 50 times is, uh, yeah. is a shock, but it's all that younger generation, they don't know any better. You know, my kids, yeah. they don't, I mean, they do, they have sketchbooks, but most of the stuff they draw today is on, uh, you know, the Wacom tablets and stuff. So, yeah. and I yeah. just see that's, that that's what they're going to want to do in their careers, whatever they end up doing. Yeah, so. no, I get it. I mean, we had, um, <clears throat> this red hood book that I did with, uh, for white Knight, we had uh, Simone DeMeo do the interiors. He mostly did issue one because he fell behind. But I love his art, but he does stuff with the Wacom tablet that I like the way he can bend perspective and use fisheye lenses and do blur effects and textures. There's just no way to replicate that traditionally. So mm -hmm. the art snob in me is like, oh man, you're doing it on a computer. That doesn't count. But the capitalist in me or the person that's his publisher because he's putting it out under my line is happy that whatever it takes to get it done man you know <laughs> but what he started to do is to do a hybrid where he will print out the rough um <clears throat> some of the lines that go on the final page for like a cover or splash he'll print it out and then he'll finish rendering it with like a grease pencil or something like that and so he does have an original piece of art <clears throat> it is like a hybrid so half of it is printed and half of it is uh inked and i'm mm -hmm. not sure like as a comic book buyer how people feel about that because it is one of a kind there it's not like he's doing two or three of these things but at the same time there is the computer element on it it's almost like uh artists who print out in blue line and then go over it the, the blue line inks like no matter how right. much you race you can never get rid of that blue line and i know european collectors hate the blue line and they don't sit see it as a fully uh, original piece i don't suppose you have right. any thoughts on that well, I mean, I would think that um, I, I I would agree with you that I, that anybody who's doing something where it's just partially, you know, the finished piece, it's probably not going to command the same price as if it was 100% traditional. If it was, yeah. you know, where they're blending things. I mean, it was funny. There was mm -hmm. a the cover to Power Man Iron Fist 50 was in the uh, was in the Heritage auction, right? And I didn't really look at it. I didn't read the description. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's that one with the two of them side by side busting and there's a lot of like just figures around them, uh, you know, yeah. just to make the cover look great. Well, mm -hmm. I, you know, I remember commenting. I did a preview and I said, wow, this is probably going to do really well. I think it was at like 22, 23. Well, it yeah. ended up at 25. I'm like, what the hell happened to this thing? It's so <laughs> iconic. You know, I, I figured there had to be a couple people that would be interested in it. And I and yeah. so I, I went and looked at it and it turned out I didn't read the, the title really well. It actually said there were two pieces. Mm -hmm. Well. It turned out the the other piece that wasn't the main image they were showing was the original and the original had the so it had the characters drawn just like they were mm -hmm. um, but the background was a little different and then what they did was they they made a stat of that and then had like dave cockrum draw the background for the other one and then the stat was glued on it so the, the the piece that's published and everybody loves and everybody really remembers is a stat on a board with original art around it and i think that that detracts from the mm -hmm. the overall value i mean i, I would have thought that piece should have gone for you know, mid thirties, probably, you know, yeah. and so I think that, so when you have hybrid things like that, it does, you know, some collectors aren't going to be as excited about a piece mm -hmm. like that. Even one as memorable as, as that particular cover. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm going to give and, a shout out to uh, Nick Barucci here. I saw him in the, uh, the comments. Ah, um, uh, yeah. Yes. Hey, he's yeah, got Nick my, my, my wife, Katana Collins is working for him on a book that's, uh, I think it's been announced called cherish. And uh, I also did a Red Sonja cover for him. And uh, I got it into my head that Dynamite published nude covers or did adult variants or something. Uh-oh. <laughs> so I drew Red Sonja with like leather and, you know, she's got armor for some reason, but a lot of skin showing. But her, her, her boobs are hanging out. And I did a version with her boobs hanging out and then one with a chain mail, like a, a little thumbnail sticker. So if the if the buyer wants to re reattach it, he can, you know. Uh-huh. And um, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, Nick's a smart guy. He likes to make money. They can do an adult variant or black bag variant for this. And uh, he's either he or the editor wrote back. He's like, thanks. Appreciate the offer. But we, we don't really publish news. <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, well, whatever. At least I have a nude Red Sonja cover that I can totally uh, get money for now. <laughs> And Nick says the original art will sell for more. Yeah, <laughs> um, that was the real reason I did it. Like, even if Nick doesn't jump on this, I know I can sell this art and have like a funny story to go along with it. I actually think I have it here. I can go grab it, but uh, maybe later for running out of things to talk about. All <laughs> right, <laughs> everybody's interested now. Oh, you know what? Let me go find. Hold on, keep you yourself busy for it. one minute. Oh man, that is funny. 
<laughs> that's for Nick's personal collection, says Marcus. Ah, uh, yeah, that's great, Marcus. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, hey, Jordan, nice to see you in the chat tonight, too. Uh, I'm sure that it probably isn't the original, but we can ask. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you uh, I'm gonna put you in the spot of power here. Let's see. Uh, uh, there sadly, uh, I think I gave it to my art dealer. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, oh, I was all yeah. set to show it off. But I know. Oh, sorry. This is why we need Jeff here. Um, yeah. He's watching, he'll pop in and hold it up for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom in to each of the booths. Well, so so only Nick and you have seen it, as far as uh, as far as we know. I can maybe can I post it on the uh, comments here somehow? Uh, sure. Unfortunately, yeah, you can't interact with the chat while we're right. in the studio. Yeah. Can that's... I email it to you directly? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. All right. So make that work. What's your email, Bill? You can bill it bill at comicartfans.com will work. Yeah. Bill at comic fans.com <laughs> oh, nick is emailing oh. it to me now as well oh nick's all right nick's got it okay <laughs> does nick have the he better have the topless version man we're gonna we're pimping this thing like crazy <laughs> um this is yeah funny. so you get it from bill yeah xena soap cope can use it um i can't remember which publisher is actually th those are, are those called black bag variants when they do like a super x-rated cover because i know scotty young did some with image i've never i've never bought a, a super x uh, variant cover before but i would imagine yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's what that, that would be how they would do it right i mean they'd have to <laughs> they were going to sell it at the comic shop well, i'm waiting for it it's probably caught in my spam folder because it says uh, big tatas on it or naked uh well we'll see all right i'll send it to you as well that way you'll get it twice Yes. Let me see. I'll make sure that my wife isn't uh, checking my email later. Okay. She's probably it's art, man. <laughs> don't be, it don't body it shame. Art. It's art. <laughs> but man, yeah. So yeah. Well, Nick says yes. Definitely black bag. Black bag. That's yeah, what it was. Chuck Arnold says black kiss used to come in black bags as well. <laughs> uh, imagine oh. a beaded curtain variant. Yeah, that's good, Mikhail. <laughs> All right, I found it here. Let me upload it to. Yeah, it's, I don't think there's a release out. date on this, but hopefully this gets Nick all excited to uh, green light. This ah, part. I well, okay, I got it. I got it. You got Let's, it. All right. <laughs> all right. Let me. Um... Man, we built this up a lot. This better be a good drawing. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. I'm thinking how the how is the best way for me to get it over to my other computer here. Let me. I'll, I'll just. Here, I'll Sean just... Murphy and Bill Cox go out of the way to find Red Sonia's <laughs> boobs. Yes, and show them off for everyone. This is how two men get canceled very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Man, this, yeah, this is going to be. I've got to transfer the file over to my other computer because I'm I'm on this crummy old Mac right here. That, oh, uh, oh thanks work. for the uh, update, Nick. Yeah, so that book, Cherish, uh, will be out after. So they did a really great ad for my wife. Um, they took out a six or eight page previews ad, which is nuts. I've never seen it. I never got an ad that big. Uh, but they did one from her, Katana Collins, my wife. So once that hits and they get some numbers back and get her name out there more, uh, I guess they're going to put it out in uh, ne next, next year, January, February. This is the Red Sonya cover that we're about to see. Sadly, you won't be able to see it topless. No, no, you won't. Uh, all right, here we go. I've got it. All right, <laughs> everybody, yeah. get your loop. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that that risque, everybody, but I can yeah. see why it got turned down. She's empowered, right? Oh yeah, she, she doesn't have the male gaze. She's you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people can judge for themselves. Nope, I completely agree here. Sorry, <laughs> I got way too many tabs here to show off. Here, let's see. Yeah, let's uh, do this. Yep. Sorry. I, I literally have four monitors here that I'm sharing files through. And they've got time. boobs on all of them. Uh, almost. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here we go. All right. Got it now in some place I can share it. Here we go. I'll have to remove that. Oh, wrong one. Let me remove that one and add the other one. Uh, it's a shirtless Terry McGinnis. Yes, exactly. Not the same. <laughs> all right. Here we go. And there it is. So hey, we, there we go. So this is the right. one that was rejected. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we've seen Red Sonia like that before. 
in my mind i thought so this is a steampunk red sonia uh and uh for some reason i thought they could do an adult variant and i just got all excited because i don't get to draw nudes very often um so i got i asked my wife and she said sure so you know she's like my shield so if anyone complains you can just complain to her <laughs> oh, she gave you the permission to, to go ahead yeah well she's uh, like whatever i mean i convinced her that we could uh put out a black bag variant of this and she was like okay but why would you do that why would you objectify her i'm like trust me comic book readers like this and uh then we got shut down <laughs> yeah but, uh, well yeah. it's the it's the age of that but uh but yeah well you know when you're messing around with uh with uh, you know characters who are of uh, oh yeah she's owned by someone and they have rules i i absolutely yeah. get it absolutely but so did the uh did the version with the top get published or is or is or did that, you that's to, the one that will be published that, so that is the one that will be published all right yeah so on the original art uh down near my signature i think i just taped with like painter's tape you can't see it so okay. I, I must have scanned this before um yeah, this is the non-adjusted file. So yeah, I just taped the her um, metal bra, whatever she, her chainmail bra. I just like scotch taped it to the bottom for the collector, and like if he wants to hang it up with the with the bra on or bra off, it's up to him. <laughs> uh, I'm just I'm reading the chat. Dino said, "Now we know the breast of the story." Yes, exactly. And and uh, <laughs> Jeff Jeff scores that cover. Says Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well you know. It's, so, it's a beautiful uh, cover. Larry Tune is asking, how will she protect her boobs without chainmail? The answer is, she's so good at sword fighting that no one can even get close. That's how empowered she is. There you go. <laughs> also, it's a very good point. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, so this will be available at some point in time. Yep. And, uh, after January, um, when uh, they announced it for my wife's book, obviously it won't be this version, but this is the one that will be for sale. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess we could sell it now. I guess I just have to make sure Nick is okay with that, but I don't see any problem with selling it now. <laughs> now it's, that we've promoted the hell out of it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for sharing this with me, uh, all of us, Sean. This is Thanks great. for posting, man. Yeah. <laughs> we sent you some other art that doesn't have to do with naked boobs. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. Even some uh, some art from uh, issue five. Well, I think five and six. I'm yeah, sure. some new stuff, too. Some art that's just fre fresh off the yeah, off the desk. Oh, look at Nick. Nick actually said it's out there. You can sell it. Next All right. <laughs> All right. Let's get this auction going, shall we? <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and Larry actually says she she looks more clothed than normal. I mean, she, the, the boots were long. I mean, I would agree. She, she did have, actually have a few more uh, yeah. wardrobe uh, pieces on her than normal. As a male who uh, men can pair topless in comics all the time. If we really want equality, then I think those ladies need to get their shirts off. There you go. There you go. Boy, we're gonna get in trouble. I'm gonna. Oh man, yeah. I've never, I've oh. never gotten, uh, you know, <laughs> into, into any kind of uh, controversial oh, yeah? oh, situation man. here on the channel Stick before. Stick with uh, me, Bill. I get people try to cancel <laughs> me like once a year. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, and I've had Frank Joe on here before, and he was he was a relatively tame compared to you, Sean. Oh wow. man, I got to ch chat with Frank uh, a little bit at San Diego. He was doing um, a whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I went up to him, like, hey, my name is Sean Murphy. You probably don't know me. He's like, I know you. I'm like, cool. I just wanted to say thank you so much for messing with Robbie Rodriguez for five years now, doing those outrage covers that uh, brought he, someone tried to cancel him or <laughs> at least throw a heavy amount of shit Frank Cho's way. And he went with it. And he actually probably made a lot of money off of that outrage by doing these outrage covers, which I think are still pretty hot to these days. <laughs> oh no I he's mean, uh yeah he he has gotten a lot of mileage out of it he's still and you know he and brilliant it is and uh, you know morger <laughs> i think morger kind of spurs them on a little bit i mean they they, they feed off each other in their in their brand of humor so they've uh but there yeah you go. Frank, frank's a one-of-a-kind uh, guy and yeah uh, I, i'm always well i always like you know the, the day after a con that frank's been at because there's always a lot of uh very humorous uh you know sketch covers that he puts out yeah 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 anything that he sells so he, you know, I I, I I love the guy to death, and I, I can always tell when when you guys do art drops too, because Calf gets inundated with posts of your artwork. So, oh, which is a good cool. thing because uh, we you know we feature art on the Calf update, so it seems like you know we go through these spurts where we're over a two or three week period. You know, either uh, the, my partner who does the work, Chris Nork, with me when we're picking artwork, either he or I are picking a piece of your art 
uh, mm. during those uh, those art drops because they're just awesome and it's great to see. Oh, but they, okay. but it's you can you just know it when when Jeff releases a, you know a new batch of artwork because there'll be about a at least mm. five to ten new pieces on calf during that week. Lately, yeah. So we sold issues three and five complete to the same buyer, um, and uh, we weren't able to offer art for. I think we had to skip a whole month. So when we came out with issue four, people sort of lunged at it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, not, I'm always kind of cautious about like, is it smart to sell a whole issue to one person? Um, you know, you're giving someone a lot of control over your market. If they're a, a big buyer, like if they're a reliable buyer and I know that they're not the type to sell stuff for a while, I'll usually be more okay with it. Um, mm -hmm. If I know someone's a flipper and they're going to flip it in two months and I think that's going to be risky, then I'm more likely to, like lean away from it. But yeah, if someone wants it bad enough, I mean, they give you a, a the, 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 the uh, fuck you price or whatever. Right. Um, but you don't uh, put any, uh, any strings attached or you tell them you can't split it up or no, I mean, legally, I don't think you can really do that anyway. No, try. no you, <laughs> right. Well, you could, you could try. I just, I was curious if you, if you did or you didn't. Yeah, I should. I, I never thought about it. I, I've been so open with people doing what they want with it for years. It just never occurred to me to like request that they keep it together. Or, I don't know. I, you know what I can say is person that buys naked red Sonia, you must throw that pasty away. So she should always be topless. That's the <laughs> right. Deal. When you, when you frame it and hang it on your wall. <laughs> yeah. Right. In your, yeah, in your kid's nursery. <laughs> Man, but well, but yeah, at the end of the day, you're right though. If the guy if or gal that wants a complete issue one day decides they want to break it up, yeah, uh, it's their prerogative, like you know, to do so. Yeah. I mean, dealers do it, you know, quite a bit. Like, you know, you, you do see it a lot. I mean, I, I'm friends with a lot of dealers and I see them buy like maybe it's a 10 page story that was in something. And uh, because Anthony had one recently where we tried selling it on the dueling dealers show, it didn't sell as a complete, uh, mm -hmm. uh you know, book. And when we were at that Columbus show that I was mentioning to you in the green room, they uh, somebody really wanted the title page to it, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and didn't want to buy the whole book, and so he I, he waffled on it. And by the end of the show, he he sold it because the, the, the guy made him a good offer for it. Mm -hmm. And and here, but this was like you know this is a western story, you know, so this thing okay. was probably together for forty years, and oh, he wow. broke it up. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so, wow. but so th these things happen all the time. I mean, especially with dealers, but I mean, it, with, right. you know, maybe with collectors, it's a little bit harder, you know, because they, yeah. they, they bought it because they loved it. So right. they might yeah. not want to break it up. But once it gets yeah. into a dealer's hands, you just never know, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of John Romita Jr. Uh, complete books out there from the last, say, 20 yeah. years of his career that, that I've seen that are still together. But mm -hmm. you wonder about those, you know, whether or not they'll, yeah. they'll stay together. And it will be together another 10, 15 years. What are your thoughts on someone trying to reassemble an entire issue? Um, and I have a guy that's trying to do that. And I almost, he needs to ask around to see who's got art. Mm. But you're sort of, when you, everyone knows you're trying to collect the whole thing, then they can charge you a lot more because they know how desperate you are for every single page. So you have that fine line of like, you don't want to say it too loud, but at the same time, you have to sort of tell people what you're up to. Right. Uh, well, that everything you just said is true. I mean, I've you know, got a lot of friends who are trying to complete books and the moment you it's out there and you have to let it out there because you're trying to complete it, that yeah. uh, you're going to be held hostage on, on those remaining pieces because, you know, yeah. and by and large, you know, if it's from a good book, you know that there's another, you know, 50 yeah. guys that would love to have a page from it. So, yeah. you know, if you only got half of the book together, you know, yeah. and say, you know, 12 pages and another nine yeah. or 10 or in nine or 10 collector's hands. I mean, yeah. you're going to have a really hard time, you know, being able to get those pieces back. You can try, I mean, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's tough. And, and like you said, they will hold you over a barrel the moment yeah. they know you want it. I mean, and that that's true with anything. <laughs> if somebody knows you really like Neil Adams, X-Men art, right. Yeah. And uh, you're a big collector of it. They, somebody's going to go to you and ask you for a price. That's 40% higher than, uh, yeah. than, than and they're just going to be like, I have it. I'm thinking of selling it. Uh, yeah, it would be 25, but I want 40. And yeah. If you really want it, you got to pay 40. I mean, That's if you're in the market at 25, you can probably afford 40. So if yeah. it's something that somebody <laughs> really wants, they're going to do it. I had a buyer who wanted a uh, Punisher. It's a famous cover of the Punisher outside of a window on a fire escape with a bazooka. I think Klaus Jansen drew it. Yeah. And uh, he's been wanting this cover his whole life. And he finally has the money to, to buy it. But the guy that was selling it 
wanted to sell the entire issue complete, I think. Mm -hmm. So he bought it, but I think he ended up piecing out the rest of the issue just because he was just interested in the cover. Um, or maybe he didn't. I don't know. I, I thought I heard maybe he was thinking about it or something like that. And uh, I know he paid for it. And I, uh, I, I called Klaus Jansen, who's a friend. And I, was, I don't know why. I, I probably should have done this. You know, hey, you know, Sean, you, you know that uh, Punisher cover you did? Oh, yeah. And I go, do you know what it just sold for? And I told him. And he, I get this long bit of silence on the phone. And he goes, do you know how much I sold that cover for, Sean? For like, you know, $400 back in the 80s or whatever. Right. Um, and he goes, you know, DC hasn't offered me any work for a year. And I felt so bad. Like, I don't know how he's supposed to respond when I call him up and say, you know, hey, you're, congratulations, you're paid, sold for a ton of money that you're not getting. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, that, how do you think Zach felt when, you know, that, uh, oh, that Secret yeah. Wars page, you know, sells? Or uh, right. I, had Brian, I, was, I had Brian Bolland on, in a chat on Saturday when, when that uh, Wonder Woman cover, his first Wonder Woman cover just sold for $99,000 in the, in the oh. Heritage Auction on Thursday. I mean, yeah. he's, he, mind, his mind's got to be blown when he sees something like that happen. It just, uh, yeah. he, 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 you just don't expect it. And, and same thing, I mean, you know, he, they all sold yeah. their artwork for a whole lot less. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the good news with Klaus is I, I told him which cover and he said that he actually had the, um, the sketch of that cover. Like he, he blocked it out. So we had a piece of paper that had, was part of the process. And he said he'd be willing to sell that to the buyer. The buyer wanted the stage, you know, the, the stages leading up to the cover. So yeah, Klaus was able to make a little bit of money off it. I'm glad that he still had that, but, um, yeah, <laughs> I see yeah. Uh, people throwing around Bob's name. So I guess you guys probably know more about. I can try to be. Hey, there he is. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, there, yes, Chat. that's me. <laughs> hey, Bob. <laughs> nice to see you, Bob. I try oh, to he... not name my my friends or my buyers or sellers just to try to be careful. But uh, yeah, people have your hand on the pulse more than I do. So I don't know who I'm fooling here. <laughs> it's a small hobby. You know, at the end of the day, yeah. it, you know, <laughs> we like to think it's a lot larger than it is, but, uh, but yeah, I, there's certain people that know everything and I'm not one of them just, yeah. you know, I've kind of got my hands in a lot of things, but there, there's a lot more people that know a lot of more of the secrets out there than I do, but, yeah. but I get it. I think that, um, at least he was able to, to also sell the prelim. It was funny. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to be doing an art sale with Bart Sears. I think it's in November or maybe it's October. Oh, nice. I can't even remember. But the thing is with, with Bart, he doesn't, he's got, he still has a lot of his originals, but apparently he did all of his prelims on 11 by 17 board and he did them really tight. And then he, when he typically inked himself a lot, so then he light boxed his own inks and those are the pages that he sold. So he's got complete issues of wow. tight pencil prelims on 11 Ooh. by 17 board. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not even going to say what it is. Cause then I know people will reach out to, uh, you know, <laughs> and yeah. try to see about securing it. But I was just yeah. shocked because we did a video call, you know, just to see, you know, what he had and for me to give him suggestions on what to bring. And I'm like, yeah, let's bring a, that complete issue. And just to see what we, you know, what it might do because, wow. yeah. but so I think it's cool that, you know, people who've sold a lot of their artwork, uh, earlier have kept some of those things around because, you know, yeah. I mean, it's going to. Take care of them in life i mean like al milgram has given all of his or a lot of his artwork over to heritage and they've been slowly auctioning it off and i'm sure mm -hmm. you know that's really good right i mean that he held on to yeah. it for as long as he did and we this is this is a topic that we talked about at the, in the last uh conversation a lot about thinking about retirement and how mm -hmm. to hold back artwork and yeah. um you gotta you gotta think about uh you know your the the, the later stage of uh of yeah. life when you're not gonna be able to do the do the same work at the same level that you've been doing it now yeah yeah yeah, I was, uh, I think we went over it last time. I have like four tiers, tier one stuff I'll sell for the price that it is now. Or even, I'll even go 10% low, lower just to entice buyers. Um, mm -hmm. So it looks good. I mean, I charge too much for my stuff anyway, so I don't mind coming down 10%. If it's a tier one page, then people can buy it. And if they flip it in a month or six months, they'll probably make a little bit of money. And that makes mm -hmm. them feel good. It makes me feel good. And then tier two is probably a bit more expensive. I'm looking to get market price or the year from now price and then tier three is the five year from now price and then there's the uh not this is the retirement pile so there's a pile of 20 pieces of art that i'm going to hang on to until i'm 70 and then hopefully sell that and that's sort of the end game you know but like how yeah. to trade your way up there how to adjust the dials i mean it's i mean for me it's mostly been like going on gut instinct talking mm -hmm. to people like you trying to you know talk to my buyers see what they're happy with what they're not happy with, what they don't like. And 
yeah, I, like I don't feel like I've got it figured out, but I probably put a lot more thought into it than a lot of artists have. Um, yeah, we'll yeah. see when I get to be 80. And if I have those 20 pieces left, you know, I did my job unless they're worth nothing. And I should have just sold them. Like, <laughs> yeah, you can't why, sell them for anything. Why did you uh, hang on you... to Topless Red Sonia? You could have flipped it that night to <laughs> Ron Lim or. <laughs> yes <laughs> right um I, no i you know the thing is it, other guys have done it i always i think i don't know if i mentioned it when we talked last but you know gerhard does like an annual sale of his mm. uh cerebus artwork that he did with dave sim because he right. has still has a lot of it he does he sells he does a once a year drop like 30 40 pieces probably yep. raises 60 80 thousand dollars and mm. and that's kind of what he does you know and yeah so, and I just think that's really smart, you know, because he could have just released it all out in one fell swoop 15 years ago and been done. And, you know, where would he be? But now, now mm -hmm. he's, uh, you know, that, it was just, it was very smart for him to do that. And, yeah. uh, and it certainly paid off. So, yeah. Is there an earthquake in California? Is that what I'm seeing? That's what Ron just said, a 4.4 .4 in Santa Rosa. Wow. I hope everyone's uh, safe. I'll check yeah. my phone after. That's pretty yeah. scary. Yeah, Ron just said he went to Twitter to confirm. Well, yeah. I hope everybody's all right there. Yeah, it feels pretty weird to talk about making money on art and all these great first world problems. And then you've got earthquakes hitting the other part of the country. Yeah, right. I know that's it has been weird. I mean, you know, today was like a terrible day in the stock market, too. Right. One of the one of the worst <laughs> uh, in the last I don't even know how long. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't pay any attention. I just happened to go on the uh, on my uh, regular news source around five o'clock and it was like yeah. doom and gloom and, and bright red letters. Yeah. You know, I was like, wow, I'm glad yeah. I don't pay attention to the news throughout the day. <laughs> I'd be depressed. Yeah, no, I start. I try to get off of 24 hour news. I was sucked into CNN and all that bullshit for a while. And then I realized it's just they overuse the breaking news banner and it's, it's silly and you can be, you know, a crazy liberal, just like you can be a crazy conservative and I'm trying to get back to center and just watch right. daily news at the end of the day, you know, give me the 15 minute update. You don't need to be checking the news 24 hours a day, like a maniac. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. I don't even have regular uh, TV anymore. It's just straight, you know, Netflix and Disney plus and a few other things because I, I, would, I just got burned out. You yeah know, a, few, a few elections back and i was just like you know i can't watch this stuff it just drives i know me it's not yeah. worth it i've got too much work to do <laughs> yeah yeah i'll like even with the the election stuff coming up my goal is to not follow it until the month before i have to vote because like all the brain power i burn trying to figure out the secret tactics of hillary clinton or donald trump it's like i can't it was all a lie anyway. I mean, either side, they were both lying. It was just pointless. Made myself upset for no we're, reason. We're the ones the getting duped at the end of the day. Yeah. That's, it doesn't matter by whom, but it's the truth. And it's unfortunate. <laughs> I know I'm, 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 I'm a very, I'm a very kind of, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm a very centrist kind of person as far as yeah. my, my views on a lot of things. So, so yeah. yeah, I just feel that I feel like everybody's lying to me. So I don't, I just, I don't care what, you know, I try, I, I take everything I hear with a grain of salt and everything just yeah. because I'm better off. I think, I th think that's why I've been able to run cap as long as I have and not right. go crazy, you know, being, being in charge of, you know, being the friends to the collectors and the dealers and yeah. the reps and the auction houses. It's kind of hard to be in the middle if you, with, you know, not take anybody's side, but that's kind of, I think yeah. how I've been able to do it and not, uh, and not feel like I have to lean one way or another. You know, I try to yeah. treat everybody fairly, but uh, yeah, I think yeah, the best thing that's protect yourself. It's just, staying off of social media staying off twitter don't make hot you know, hot take comments in either direction i mean your true friends know where you stand about stuff and if you're ever at an event people really want to talk then you can explain your but there's no reason to, to broadcast that shit online honestly and yeah i think it's just upset being woke and anti-woke and at the end of the day it's not units so i'm waiting for everyone to like get out of this addiction to uh the dopamine hit that is Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely avoid Twitter. Yeah. Alex Marino said the only thing yeah. he believes in is art. And there you go. That's the, there you that's go. all that we yeah. care about here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, why don't we look Twitter? at some art? You know what you want to do? Sure, that? go or, ahead. Or, yeah. we, we can keep talking uh, art and politics and stuff, but um, I'm trying to think if there's any, any, anything insightful that, you know, just before we look at the art, I guess that, you know, from, like I remember when you were talking, you know, we were, we were. I just think the concerns that we have about the art market, you know, they're going to play themselves out, whether whether we yeah. see see a, a small hit in things or we don't. I mean, 
the thing I've, I've said this a couple of times, I, I think that the people who've spent money on art there, if the, if the market goes down, they're not going to sell it. I mean, cause nobody really wants to, you know, if they have a $10,000 piece of art they they don't want to go back mm-hmm. and sell it at $7,500 yeah. now, or even six months from now, unless they're really desperate for it. So, so I think, you know, we're not going to see prices go down too often because they're just going to hold on to it until yeah. they can sell it for ten thousand again at least, or ninety five hundred. Yeah. Get close. You know, nobody's going to want to take a hit yeah. on things. But I, I think the marquee names will will hold their own, even if they dip ten percent. They're probably going to go back up ten percent. I think it's going to be like real estate in a way, if, or like real estate in um, tourist areas. So you spent a lot on a nice house on the, by the ocean. Is it going to if there's a um, you know, depression of some kind and those houses go down in value, they might go down 10%, but they're probably mm-hmm. going to come back up. Like it's not going to plummet 50%. And I think like with a lot of uh, high end art that you're talking about, I mean, there it's expensive to buy in. And even if it dips a little bit, I don't think it's going to dip a lot or it won't dip for long. But if you're talking about a lot of the art that's in the mall, a lot of the, the B and C level comics that come out every month, like glut that's out there, that stuff might not hold its own, but that's not the, stuff that's really making headlines though like people here are more interested in like medium to high-end stuff you know right oh yeah no no i think you know most of the people are here are, you know they, they want to get good examples of the work that they're getting yeah, yeah. I think. And, and by you know by and large i think most of the collectors that i'm i'm yeah. friends with are you know have that approach you know yeah. i mean only the newer collectors you know trying to figure things out you know are, yeah. are uh, maybe not as savvy but um, i have a question that i'm going to bait you to see if i can get you to be a little political here okay uh, do you think, uh, so I have no problem with the word woke for the record, but mm-hmm. do you think woke comics and the art for woke comics has value? So Superman's son is gay. Whether or not you think that's woke, whether or not you enjoyed that comic, I don't care. But do you think like the big page reveal that Superman's son is gay is actually going to be worth a lot? Or do you think that stuff is going to be like not retain its value for that long? Well, I think I, I think it will. I mean, it'll because it'll have the it'll have the a collector base that's just as interested in that as maybe you know a wedding between two popular characters uh, you know male right. and a female right so it's right. still going to have their you know that draw for mm-hmm. uh, a segment of collectors that would be interested in, in it and so yeah. so sure i think so and, and it's also you know it's it's uh whatever you whether what's the what other side of the fence you're on with a, with a work like that yeah. you're always going to say that you know it was a mo- it was a moment in time when somebody decided to do something that was going to stand out you know and make right. and and make uh, and make some rumblings in the in the comics world you know whether yeah. you agreed with it or you didn't so yeah. so yeah i think it's going to from from that perspective it's going to probably hold its value and have yeah. uh, have its collectors who would love to own it so mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah. I, I think i think so i, I would yeah. have to think so that's true Queen's job, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for that one. Uh, yeah, uh, that's what every, a few of my uh, my my British fan, uh, friends have said. You know, this is the first time they're using. Uh, you know, they've got a king. They're, they're so used to a queen, they don't know what to do with uh, with a guy in yeah. that uh, position anymore. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's funny seeing the different uh, takes around the world. You've got from Africa accusations of colonialism. You have British people. Even people who don't like the monarchy are still sad because, you know, you woke up every day and thought about the queen. Um, right. It's just insane to me now that there are very few people alive who even remember uh, before she was queen. So, yeah. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. that's, uh, that is true. And a, a couple you... other com- comments I saw in here, you know, Jeff mentioned the, you know, the North Star page too. Yeah, that's, that's true for Marvel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And. But uh, when they when they make a Hulk Asian or when they do a race swap that goes back to, gets reset immediately, um, some of these like cheaper ver- like they sort of play these tricks to, to race swap or gender swap just to grab headlines, and it's not a change well, that actually lasts. Whereas North Star is still gay to this day, as far as I know. Right, right. Well, in those cases, then they probably don't hold the same memorable, you right. know, passion for that for the reader who's now an art collector. So, so yeah, in those cases, it, it may end up just feeling like a gimmick and it yeah. doesn't end up being valuable, but, mm-hmm. but sure. I think in certain, uh, for certain stories and uh, characters, yeah. yeah, I think it, I think it will. I mean, it, yeah. it, 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 it just is what it is. I mean, I'm not, uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not very political. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. That's, that's, that's as deep as I expected you to go. Yeah. I think you did All well. Right. You avoided the laser beams. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I, I have friends on both sides. I have friends that would say, you know, that hate it. I mean, when they, uh, yeah. uh, what was the thing most recently? 
uh, oh, with the uh, with you know, I I didn't see the Thor movie until recently, right? And so, mm -hmm. and I didn't read, uh, so I even I hadn't read the like Lady Thor. I didn't really under, know the whole backstory, and I don't know how close the movie stayed to the to the book. But I, you know, I had a friend who was very adamant that they didn't even want to see the movie because they were like. I, I'm sure they're just doing it because they want to have a female Thor, you know, and uh -huh. there's going to be just some stupid reason that they had to do it. And it's just because somebody had to do it. Uh, and I, you know, and, I, and I'm like, I, I couldn't explain it to him because I didn't know I hadn't seen the movie, you know, yeah. and I actually liked the way they kind of worked it out in the movie. You know, it kind of, it was like the hammer was the, you know, it was the, yeah. the thing that made her Thor. And, and it really had nothing to do with some uh, yeah. trying to, uh, gender swap or or anything yeah, yeah. like that. So I enjoyed it, but but it's that perception. So people go into things with that perception yeah. that there's got to be a bad reason for why they're you know why why do they have to have a She-Hulk at all, right? I mean, why why yeah. why couldn't Hulk just be around, right? And so yeah. um, there's always going to be uh, you know the people on both sides who have that kind of uh, yeah. knee-jerk reaction to uh, those types of story events in comics. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. What's next? The female hawk. You're right. You just never know what's next. <laughs> I had a, uh, so I, I made my Robin in my book is, is Duke Thomas. He's black. And um, I had him take over the Robin mantle. And I almost went out there saying like, first black Robin, first black Robin. And I think I did that a little bit, but then I stopped because I'm like, I don't want this to be, to flag the culture war. Like the fact that Duke Thomas is black has nothing to do with the fact that he's Robin. I don't want to play the games that publishers in Hollywood sometimes play. Um, so I had a guy who was interested in buying the art and he goes, this is the first, uh, appearance of black Robin in the Robin suit. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, is he going to be black forever? Or is this going to lose value? And I go, well, the character is black. So yeah, the character is going to be black forever. Are you asking me if he's <laughs> going to be Robin forever? And the guy's like, oh, either one. I'm like, yeah, I promise you he's not, we're not going to race swap Duke Thomas to being white anytime soon. Um, <laughs> right. he'll, he'll he'll definitely, black, right? He's definitely Robin in my book and he can only get upgraded from there. So as far as him becoming a Nightwing in the future or a Batman, who knows? Like White Knight's crazy. I can do what I want, but I promise you he's never not going to be a superhero from now on. So he's like, okay. And he bought the page. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. He yeah. sold him on it. Yeah. <laughs> But did you charge a premium? Was there, what did you have a, you know, was no, there, I didn't. <laughs> I no? can't. If I did, I would have felt like I should donate it to the NAACP or something. <laughs> there you go. Hey, people have asked, and I think we talked about this, like the Blade Runner. Is that an original poster on the back or is that a repro or, or what do you, what that, do you yeah, that was an original from 1981. Oh, um, I forget what that size is called, but I actually checked because there's a way to tell. So that night, after they printed out posters, the staff, stayed late printed out a whole bunch more and the whole bunch more posters are not worth as much as the original um like uh the, the official run and the way to tell is there's a certain star constellation that you can see on the edge and if you can see that star constellation then you have uh an original versus the one they made later on at night they weren't supposed mm -hmm. to i think either one is pretty cool to own sadly right. i thought i had the um the kind of glass that kept the sun off of it and it's bleached pretty badly at this point. So I might have ruined it. <laughs> the value is no longer there, but you still love it. Well, that's what I was thinking because yeah. it looks a little faded. And so yes. I think, you know, I think yeah. maybe Dino asked earlier if he thought it was original because it does look like, you know, there's something not right with it. So it's, yeah. uh, it's faded. Yeah, it's original. It used to be in better shape, but I fucked it up by not putting uh, that glass. I forget what it's called. Um, UV glass on it. But I was also mm -hmm. told that UV glass doesn't actually work 100% anyway, but. I don't know. It is what it is. Well, I mean, even with UV glass, you still want to keep it out of the sun. I mean, uh, you know, you just can't. Yeah. With the way the mediums are, yeah, you can't. I would. Yeah. I wouldn't risk it. I, I. I still get UV glass when I, on the rare occasion that I do frame stuff, but I always still right. make sure that it's not hanging anywhere near. Yeah. Direct sunlight. So my studio is all windows, and I did not think about what it would do to the pieces that I hung up. And it's funny. Some pieces hold up really well, like the cheap ass posters that DC made like for promotional purposes, mm -hmm. not faded at all. But then you have that classic piece there that's faded and some other, I don't know, I have like laser discs or artwork hanging up and that's faded and, uh, oh, well, it's too late now. How long have you been in that space? Uh, I built this space three years ago. So it all faded pretty quickly and it gets a lot of light in here, a lot. So I even have to like block out windows because uh, the sun beams keep coming in and streaking across my uh it works <laughs> it's, like a, 
it's like a sundial of ancient cultures and like i can almost tell what t what time of year it is by it's noon and i can't see my page because there's light right there <laughs> this is basically what happened this is why native americans were able to figure out how to plant corn or something like that right <laughs> Yeah, when I, I uh, owned that miniature golf course, uh, there was this. You know, there you I was go. Be, yeah, I built and owned a miniature golf course for yeah. 13 years. And that were one of my worst experiences ever. But uh, but uh, there, there was a spot where I stood behind the counter, and you know, the sun coming through the door, I knew what what just like right. you said what the season was because when that thing was blinding me and I couldn't see anything at six yeah. o'clock, you know, in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, you know, I knew it was September, and uh, you know, fall was uh, on its way, or or, yeah. or it was May. You know, it was, it was going the other way and I hated it because it was like an hour long period where I couldn't see people walking through the, you know, the door. Yeah. The sun was right in my eyes. Yeah. Hated it. But, so um, it's funny, this ancient culture there for the, for human beings to figure this out millions of years ago, that meant there had to be some like lonely horn cusk, uh, corn husker who would sit on the same rock every day, all year. And okay. after a few years, he's noticing his sunburns always were worse in April. And he must've been like, you know, I think there's a predictability to the sunlight. And then he's trying to explain it to the chieftains and they're like, shut the fuck up. You're just a corn husker. What do you know? Like, it's interesting. How long did that happen before some human finally cracked the code and figured it out? Right. He became the shaman after that because he, he did. thought, he, <laughs> yeah, I'm not the he corn husker the anymore. It, right? he, got, he used to be the guy that cleaned, you know, like you said, clean corn or uh, he was doing the laundry or something by the by the <laughs> river. But yeah. yeah, no, it's true, though. It, you know, you, you never know how those things came about. Yeah. How do we get? The, how do we get here? I don't know, um, man. Let's, let's look at some artwork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should. Um, but you know, one question I was I did want to ask you because you're speaking about the the sunlight and everything. What is your like daily work schedule like? I mean, do you get up early and work, or do you, are you more in the evening? Uh, you know, kind I, of illustrator. I mean, I work from nine to five, four yeah. uh, five days a week. I try to stay on a normal schedule like a human being. Um, yeah, I haven't worked weekends for about 12 years. I, I put my foot down a long time ago and I said, I'm just not working weekends anymore. And I sort of made it work. Uh, and I'll stay late if I have to. Like today, I work till seven because I'm a little bit behind on my Batman stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, mostly it's nine to five. I go to sleep at midnight. I get up at seven. Actually, I have a, a page of art I just finished today. It's a two page spread. I don't get to do very many of these which is dumb because I'm writing the story. So I should do an entire book of splashes. Uh, yes, I should. didn't, didn't figure that out until like a month ago. <laughs> so it's a two page spread of a uh, Batman Robin and uh, let me get in here. Yeah. See, so it takes you from, uh, sorry, I'm trying to do this in reverse. The death of his parents to when uh, Dick comes home for the first time to Wayne Manor to Batman uh, putting the Robin costume on him, to Dick and Barbara starting to date, so I drew her behind the wheel, to them sort of getting romantic as Robin and Batgirl, and then the confrontation between Dick and Batman when he found out that uh, he Batman knew her identity, he didn't tell him. And then here's a, just a splash of um, Nightwing and Batgirl in their white knight clothes. So I've got, I don't know, some kind of meaningful dialogue going over some of this, but... Uh, this page took me forever. I saved it to the end because I knew if I screwed it up, it would just put me in a bad mood. So finally today I finished it and uh, my eyes still hurt from looking at it. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, some oh, pretty man, that's good gorgeous. Detail I'm happy with here. I didn't know if like him touching her leg was too sexual because DC gets weird sometimes. So I'm like, well, I'll have her like playing with his belt like they're about to get into it. Maybe that'll be okay. <laughs> I might be overthinking it though. As long as they're both right at it. Yeah. And then, you know, I never really drew Bruce's parents uh, dead. Uh, and I, I threw the pearls in there, of course. Um, yeah. So pretty happy with that. And then I've got another splashy one here of, um, whoops, upside down. Yeah. So uh, Dick is falling off a building. And then we get this reveal that Bruce has jumped down after him. And you can see, um, you know, the city back there, the streets and all that. And he's basically falling to his death. So then uh, we get another panel, open panel here of uh, Bruce trying to catch up to him. And Jack's here. He's a, a hologram in this book. So he's kind of omniscient. And he's basically saying, oh, man, this is awesome. So uh, Bruce pulls out two grappling hooks and he attaches one to the other. And he 
shoots the grappling hook down into Dick's hands. Dick grabs it, and they both are able to basically get out of there. So I'm pretty happy with that one. Wow. But yeah, like getting the cropping here, like, all right, how do I make it so Bruce is big enough, but we can kind of see the front of him even though he's going away from us? And how do I get it so that this boot doesn't go behind this panel? How do I, you know, how much room do I have for this hand before it overlaps this part and Joker's dialogue? So like most of it's just like really careful blocking. And once you figure that out, it was pretty like basically I drew these panels and like 30 they're not that that complicated but yeah the money shot here and then the city stuff was probably the the most labor uh on this piece and uh yeah and then i sent you some more from issue six or five i don't know where you want to start oh, bill i think you're muted buddy oh sorry i was there you go. thanks man <laughs> i uh i took a a nice drink of, of coke and i burped i knew it was coming. Oh, okay so I, had my <laughs> mic and forgot that. I was i was i was you know too in awe of the artwork but what i wanted to ask you on that one piece was um you know how much of that is planned out in the uh you know in your in i guess when you're when you're doing a rough of the, the piece because the way you were fitting those panels in there and everything i mean are you working that out on the board itself so so you've got it okay so that's, that's what this is this is what i wanted to see yeah, this is like the size of a baseball card. You can see Robin and Batman there. And I knew I wanted the city to pop up with skyscrapers to break up the, the panels. Uh, and I, it was a kind of a risky page. Like, I didn't know if it was actually going to work. I actually tried two different versions of this. I can't find the other thumbnail right now. Um, but yeah, all my uh, I thumb out. So here's another version. Originally, I thought of that Batman that spread as they're coming at us towards the camera. And then I had the buildings going up in perspective to divide the panels. But mm -hmm. I felt that just just wasn't right. I felt like it would be stronger if the buildings were more straight on. Um, and honestly, I think both work. It's just sort of what your preference is. And you can right. see I sort of laid out where I wanted the uh, uh, word balloons to go to kind of just sort of flow across the page like this, you know, from left to right and um yeah i can't find the other one i showed you so oh yeah so originally... you, you, were, you were thinking as much about the, the 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 cityscape as you were as about the characters i mean how they yeah how appear. i mean I, and i know backgrounds you know are your to me they're your thing i mean i i, I love looking at yeah. the characters as much as i love you drawing a library right so oh yeah thank you <laughs> so i think that, there's... that's cool so there's the thumbnail of the other one i showed you which i did not go with this one. So I laid this out and I thought, okay, we can see Bruce from the front and Dick who's falling from the front, but they're so medium size. Like I kind of want a more, um, I want a bigger image for them. So then right here, I came up with another version, which is what you saw. Yeah, you changed the found, perspective well, on it, right? Yeah. So I'll draw Bruce from the side. You can kind of see the front of him a bit, but he's still falling away from us. So, uh, you know, that would end up working a lot better, but you can still see like um, my idea of having the two floating figures here and the grappling hooks like that all stayed. Right. But I think the day of, I think I wrote a note to myself right there saying, rethink this. Yeah. I said, rethink the building basically because it's not working. So I'll do that after. So I'll do all these and like, I'll take two days and just lay out an entire issue and I'll try to look for weaknesses and I'll write notes to myself. Like, Hey, when you get to this page, maybe rethink this panel. And uh, sometimes I can fix it and sometimes, I try and it doesn't work out, but it is what it is, you know? Right. Right. Well, that's cool. Cause I thought of that because on that last one that you showed where the, the two panels in the lower right, where you have the, uh, the, the wire from the grappling gun coming off yeah. the page. I was curious, you know, is that worked out on this, on the final piece, but it's not, you've actually had it right there in the rough as well. Yeah. It's almost drawn exactly as you did it in the rough. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted the one line to cut through this panel here and, yeah. um, yeah, as, you know, that's the thing. Well, like, I know my stuff can look pretty loose and uh, raw sometimes, but there's a lot of planning to get the uh, blocking just right. Uh, like my worry is sometimes I do too much measuring and too careful and it starts to get tight and I'm trying to go for a raw look. And that's what's so hard is like a lot of raw artists can't do tech or clear uh, perspective because... Like I love Jim Mahfoud, but his stuff mm -hmm. is all done with the calligraphy nib and it's really hard to get depth with that, but he's able to do it to his credit. So I was looking at his stuff, trying to think like, how do I get to be raw, but also retain my technical skill that people seem to like. So yeah, just sort of a process that'll never stop evolving, you know? Right.
Right. No, that's really cool. And I saw that little uh, paste in that you did on your on your roughs you know, where you when you fix it out. I mean, that's just that's just cool. It really is neat to, to see that, you, you know, how you work that out, because I, oh, yeah. I don't Thanks. Know, I, mean, I, I and I think a lot of people felt the same way. Uh, RG1, Noah, uh, how much of the script is done before you start working on those pages? I mean, you had the word balloons in, so you must have a general <laughs> idea of what. Uh, yeah. How much dialogue needs to go on those pages? Yeah. I do full tight scripts before I start working. Uh, my my friend Paul Pope likes to be a lot looser with his scripts. And Daniel Warren Johnson, he'll often start drawing pages and he won't know the ending to an issue, which I think is cool, but I can't do that. Like I'm more of a traditional kind of movie screenplay guy where you don't write the beginning. You don't start the beginning until you know your ending. You want to know most of the dialogue, uh, where stories are headed. I feel like there's a, a strict rule to how plots unravel and i mm -hmm. think a lot of artists don't feel like doing that stuff or they're not good at it so you get a lot of hit and misses from artists that are writing their own stuff but i think maybe why white knight mostly works is because i try to lay everything out ahead of time and be really careful with where my issues end where the page turns happen how much dialogue there is and uh if you read um volume one you'll see that i crammed a lot of dialogue in there with monologues and stuff and i, I wasn't as good at planning for the white uh, word balloons as I am now. Mm -hmm. So I try to, I'm, I used to drive my letterer crazy. Cause he's like, you have like a back forth back balloon, but you drew the characters on the other side. So like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. So I would take his notes and try to get better at it to make his life easier. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's still, you know, sometimes still things still don't work out as much as you try. <laughs> now see Bob said, uh, you've got a, a great ability to force your eye to move panel to panel. Oh yeah. It's very Thanks. well thought yeah. out. Yeah, I try. Let's see. Uh, what do we got here? Someone wanted to know if you uh, blow those layouts up and work from them, or you just draw. You just that's just a reference. Just reference. Yeah, I don't blow them yeah. up. Yeah, uh, Stelfreeze does that, and a lot of other artists do. Um, Stelfreeze, uh, Ryan Stelfreeze is a good theory where he says if it looks good at the size of a baseball card, then it'll look good blown up to eleven by seventeen, which I think he still does. Mm -hmm. He's not. He's not wrong. Well, that's uh, when we do our art picks for our, the Thursday show. I, I almost know when I see a thumbnail if it's a piece I really want to look at and you know might want to be one of the ten picks I get. And I just I make my judgment on the thumbnail most of the time. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I may only look at thirty thumbnails that I really like, and it's enough to click to see the detail to see if the piece is one that I really want to feature. But I make yeah. all my judgments based on the thumbnails. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, like a good layout should have. 25% black, 25% white or flipped. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to describe just off the cuff. But yeah, if, if it's like 50-50, a lot of detail everywhere, and you don't have like a stark white spot or a stark black spot, like those boring black spots actually draw you in. And you don't want to kill your blacks or kill your whites by noodling around too much. And I find that the 75-25 the rule is what I call it, that uh, you need to have more than one of the other is all it's saying. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I noticed that too. Well, very cool. Did you? Uh, and that was—that's a uh, lesson you've uh, taught yourself, or did you have somebody kind of suggest? I remember where that I heard too? that. Yeah, I've since taught other people, but I don't remember where I picked it up. Uh, I wish I could say I invented that, but I know I didn't, or I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, I've got some. I have some slides here to look at, and uh, let's see. I'm trying to find the ones that uh, Jeff gave me here. He gave some some from like issue two as well, but. Maybe I'll start. Sure. Let's see. Let me highlight, highlight a couple here. So, all right, let me get that. Are uh, there any topless ones with boobs? No, there are no topless ones. Oh, I, yeah, that, that, the only <laughs> one. I've only seen one from you so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I had I had no expectations going into the chat tonight that that was going to be <laughs> something we were going to be looking at here. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's yeah, that's from issue two. Yeah, this is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you want to start there, or do you want me to move up? He had sure. some from two, four, and then uh, and none yeah. of five, but six. You can skip that one and get something something better. It's basically a glorified talking headshot. Yeah. I try to throw some tech in there too, just to make the page more interesting. All right, let try me... to avoid talking heads, even if I if I write them into the script. All right, I'll jump over to that. let's see issue four here. Where are we at? There we go. And share that screen. 
how many people do we have here? 60, 100? Uh, 90. 90 people 90. right now. All right. Yeah, good number. Yeah, so this is a good one. You have a splashy. I'm seeing that one, two, three, four, five. So six panel page, uh, splashy panel six. Uh, I don't normally break panel borders and do um, crazy 90s stuff <laughs> with my mm -hmm. layout. But uh, I'm trying to do more and more because I'm embracing the fact that comics can do this and no other medium can, as long as it doesn't disrupt the storytelling. No, this is... I really, yeah, you know, this was a pretty cool page, but you see, you, you don't like to break the borders too often. I mean, is that I try? It took me a while to get comfortable because I first I was trying to be a purist, and by breaking panel borders, it's just a trick that illustrators use, and I didn't think it was conducive to storytelling. If you're going to be really snobby about storytelling, then you could argue that you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. However, I've loosened up over the years and I've realized breaking panel borders like that makes panel six look more like a cool splash of duke coming out of a skylight um it just makes the page pop more and i have started to accept that this is something that comic books can do that no other medium can you know mm -hmm. right like that right. batman that batman page where he's jumping and uh trying to save robin with the batarangs like you animation can do a lot of things cgi can do a lot of things but only comic books can use can play with your brain in that way using basic 2d image of a page and play with perceptions and panels and overlapping and stuff like that so you think, do you think about the coloring on, on a piece like this when you're uh, doing it or, or does yeah. that not really, okay. I do. Like if Barbara was wearing red, I wouldn't have done that because his hood is red. So I, I try to be cautious of that stuff. Um, sometimes I forget. Sometimes there's really nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. um, I usually have my colorists do like a two panel palette or a three panel palette. So I'll, I don't like, I think a lot of American comics looks like the Skittles factory exploded. There's just too much colors everywhere. And, you know, when you're coloring the JLA or X-Men, there's so many, I mean, what are you supposed to do, right? So right. I try to design my characters with limited palettes. So it makes Dave Stewart's job in this case easier. So if uh, you have a lot of reds in the city, you've got Duke and a lot of red, and then you would just need to find some cools somewhere to balance it out. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what he did, but he, he's a genius. And he, he, he doesn't really need my notes. He does such a good job. But you you do make notes in some cases, right? Yeah, I'll write like a um, a page of notes for different panels for the colorist, um, and I also I'm careful. I don't want to tell him how to do his job or m make his life harder. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that he would rather have notes from me. And f for me, uh, even when I get the first round of colors, I generally try to not give notes at that point unless it's something really bad, like oh, you colored that flesh color. It's supposed to be red with tights or whatever. Mm -hmm. um like I, I really try to let the uh colorist do their own thing and not be a pain in the ass if i can help it <laughs> um yeah i also don't want a lot of um cuts i try to keep things pretty flat i'll have uh, my colorist use a texture to make a grainy look on it which i think breaks white knight apart from other books i think when you grab most comics again you get like a skittles explosion but with ours, you get like a European colored sensibility where we're just using two or three color palettes and that that's it. And the whole book is kind of designed around that palette. Like I don't really have characters that have a lot of green on them. I usually use mostly warms and I feel like it makes Dave's jobs Dave's job easier when he has to do his work. Mm -hmm. Well, then you, you just answered a question from the audience where somebody said <laughs> well, I know about a specific color design, you know, or color palette yeah. going into it. So you do. Yeah. Yeah. Like I knew that uh, Barbara in panel five there, she has a black leather jacket and a purple sweater. And no matter what Dave does with that, it's going to pop the red hood of Robin. So I knew that was probably going to be a no brainer. And whatever Dave chooses to do with the rest of the panels, like I feel like he's kind of in my head a little bit. So he must see what I'm trying to do because he does such a good job. Well, that's cool. And uh, yeah, I'm not familiar. Has he worked with you a lot before? Uh, yeah, so he used to work on me way back in the day. I did a book called Joe the Barbarian, Hellblazer. Uh, and then I switched to Matt Hollingsworth from when I did the book called The Wake. And I was with Matt up until last year. And then uh, we had a scheduling conflict. So I started working with Dave again. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I'm lucky. I mean, they're both A-plus talents. So I, I really can't complain. Yep. There's a... Uh, four as well. Yep. Yeah, playing with speed lines 
trying to break down the figures as they're fighting into basic black shapes and then use like a uh, manga style speed lines to create more motion. Um, yeah, I had a, uh, at first I had Duke's staff just be a stick. And then I realized, well, if, uh, Richard is, uh, in a Robocop suit, then there's no way a stick is going to take him down. So I had <laughs> electricity bolts to it. So it's like, okay, it's like a sci-fi bow staff. So there you go. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting, you know, a lot of, uh, but, you know, so for one, you didn't break any of the panels here, right? Everything, everything's pretty much within the panel. Yeah, but, everything's pretty standard. But with the action lines here, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of artists would actually put the you know the the movement lines on the characters around their fists, the back of their head, uh, near the staff. And, you know, they, there'd be a line on the gun to illustrate that it's popping up in the air. You're not really worrying about that. You're you're putting in those action lines behind it to at least you know give everybody yeah. a sense that there's a lot of motion going on here. But but you're not yeah. like leading them on. You're not saying here here's some action lines coming off of the end of my elbow as I'm yeah. I'm I think I that's that's kind of cool. You're not you're 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 trying to tell that without forcing it on us to to see that. Yeah, I think that's, thanks. That's, cool. that's funny. There, the who is it doing it? Daniel Warren Johnson does it, where you zigzag the containment line. So if your fist is moving, mm -hmm. they'll like zigzag the containment line of the fist, and it, it's cool. Look, I've never needed it before. I might try it someday, but I I noticed that that technique is taking off a lot as there's more uh, Daniel Warren Johnson influenced artists out there which is fantastic because he's great but yeah i've never yeah. found a way to use that yet i've got enough going on with the amount of textures i use i don't need to <laughs> add a, a zigzaggy any more zigzags than i already use right right and you know we actually talked about that uh on the on our calf update a few weeks ago where I'll, sometimes it's hard to, for me to i'll see a piece and i'll think oh it's a daniel warren johnson because mm -hmm. of some of the stylistic things going on around the character or what, what, like how they're drawing action lines or something and then, and then yeah. it's not but right. so it's cool. His influence is, you, you know, it is, it is going out there. I mean, and that's, that's the sign yeah. of somebody who's, uh, who's got a, you know, really has their pulse on something really exciting and different to, when you see other yeah. people trying to emulate it in the, you know, and, and put their own spin on it. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause Daniel, I think, um, an artist named James Heron did that style first, but then mm -hmm. Daniel Warren Johnson came out and did it something different. And I think his career, I don't know what, um, James Heron's doing now. I, th I thought he was going to be big and uh, maybe he is and I don't realize it, but Daniel Warren Johnson sort of came along and ate his lunch, <laughs> I feel like, and sort of took that style and made it his own. And then he's able to produce work quicker beyond books that are highlighted for whatever reason, you know, Daniel Warren Johnson is more of a name than, uh, than James was. And I, I love both their styles, but it's interesting how one artist can get something to take off and the other person doesn't or whatever. Right. I mean, who knows what, what kind of, you know, whether it's a style or it's just their, uh, yeah. their business savvy. Right. I mean, I don't know it. I'm sure it, there's lots of uh, different reasons why some people yeah. get work and some people can't, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know, or get, get more high profile books. Yeah. They're just finding books to highlight your style in the right way. You know, it, sometimes your book's just a bad fit for an artist and the book will be about the character. Or it'll be about the writer or the event and it won't be about the artist. Whereas if, I try to do projects where my stuff's highlighted uh, and it sort of led me to my own Batman universe. But, you know, before that, like it was a, I was going to do Batman year one with Scott Snyder and then a bunch of other artists joined on, too. And I'm like, wait, I don't want to be one of 20 artists. I want to be my own guy. So I ended up turning it down. Oh, so Heron is doing his own creator own books. image. OK, that's good. Ah, I'm sorry. I was looking at the chat. Oh, thank you, awesome. George. Yep. That's good. Yeah, James is awesome. And uh, yeah, both are ripped by Felix. All right, so what do we got here? This is a uh, Batman Beyond uh, White Knight uh, six yeah, cover. It's a cover. We've got uh, do uh, sorry Dick and uh, Jason back to back. I was kind of going for like a uh, an old Nintendo game called Bad Dudes, where it's just two burly guys, bloody knuckles back to back, about to kick some ass. I mean, this one isn't that profound of a cover. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted a nice back-to-back -back shot of them and then uh you know bruce in the foreground that this one was tricky because nightwing's mostly blues and uh red hood's mostly red so a blue and red and white cover could be very patriotic if you're not careful not that there's anything wrong with being patriotic but it's just red and blue aren't not two colors that i would normally put together so this mm -hmm. cover ended up being pretty 50 50 blue and red 
and I couldn't find a way to like make the color more blue or make it more red to help the palette. Uh, so, I mean, I'm proud of it, but I, I think I was thinking it would have come out a little bit better than it did once it got colored, but there's only so much the colorist can do. <laughs> well, it's, well, you know, again, you're, you're uh, showing off your, your work here on this, on the skyline too. I mean, I, I don't know what do you, I, I see what your challenge is. I'm curious. I actually have not seen the color version of it, so I'll have to yeah. check it out. Yeah, I mean, you got the, the Nightwing symbol behind Red Hood is blue, so he pops out with the blue background. Right. And then you got it reversed. So it this yeah, and then you have this weird uh, line up the right side behind my signature. I don't know what mm -hmm. it's just a design element. I don't know. I thought maybe Dave would be able to do something with it to, to save it. <laughs> uh, I felt. Like I love the black and white of this, but I know as a colorist, this is sort of doomed uh, when it comes to be colored because you're sort of locked into blue and red, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll check it out and uh, I'll, I'll let you know what I think of it. Yeah, thanks. Don't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a romance cover with uh, Nightwing and Batgirl about to smooch it up on a building, and she's got her top on, unlike Red Sonia. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> the would not be happy. I always felt it was, I always felt weird when superheroes kiss in full costume on buildings. Uh, like I like Batwoman and Catwoman, but I just felt like even when Jim Lee does an amazing drawing of them kissing, it always just felt weird to me. Cause like, really these people are dressed like this and making out on a roof. Just, it's just too much. So when I do these sorts of panels, I'll try to make them like about to kiss. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm fooling myself and it's just as silly. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's like, why doesn't he ever draw them kissing? They, they just <laughs> want that, that climax moment, and you're yeah. not giving it to them, Sean. We want full penetration. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, you're, you're right. I can see what you, I, I don't know. I'm kind of one of those guys that when, when something like that happens, like in a, I, I get too sappy and I almost turn away and, and don't look. I mean, this, oh, I, yeah. I, I'm going to look, right? So, yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's a, that's a good approach, you know. For a lot of people it's not i don't think it's disappointing that you uh you aren't going for that big moment <laughs> thanks yeah maybe i'll do a full makeout scene later on see if i can pull it off but <laughs> it's all about preference yeah. um i gotta get going about 15 minutes here but oh, okay uh, well why don't we yeah well, i think uh we, i don't think we got a ton of other images here but we can go through them quick i think we got sure. five more from cool. uh, uh book six here awesome yeah these are this the issue i just finished spoilers um bruce and harley woke up uh after sleeping together now i'm not saying if they had sex or not there's sort of a lot of context behind what leads up to the scene but this is basically their awkward morning after and uh, again i'm not confirming if they actually did it or not but um actually i can tell the whole story uh so in issue five uh are, Jack, we, are we spoiling it for everybody we're spoiling it. yeah we're gonna spoil it you hear that, so, everybody? If you you, you got to like mute uh, your audio if you don't want to hear this. <laughs> so uh, Jack Napier is a hologram inside Bruce's head. He is like Bruce's Jarvis in a way. He can help Bruce. He can like hack into computers. He's got Bluetooth or whatever. So he's sort of like Bruce's Robin. Um, in issue five, Bruce is having a panic attack and he can't move. So Jack takes over his body. And it's this Freaky Friday situation where Bruce is now in a suit and tie. And he's a hologram. And Jack is in Bruce's body. And you can see his face. So it's like, in my version, Joker's biggest fantasy is to become Batman because he's the self-described biggest Batman fan ever of Gotham mm -hmm. or whatever. So uh, at the very end of that issue, Jack is still in Bruce's body. And they run into Harley. And she doesn't know that they've switched. And Jack is overcome. And he kisses Harley because he's like, this is the last chance I'm ever going to get to kiss her. I'm already dead. I'm basically a hologram. So Harley thinks she's kissing Bruce, uh, but it's actually Jack. And uh, I have friends who are like, you got to be careful. It's very problematic because Bruce is basically being hijacked by Joker. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, long story short, this issue starts with the morning after where uh, Harley has figured out what happened and she doesn't blame Bruce because it's not his fault. Bruce has regained control of his body. And um, yeah, so that's what this scene basically is. It's really, uh, I'm really happy with it. And uh, issue five especially is a lot of fun. It's just all action and, and awkwardness. Um, yeah, and again here with these panels, I, uh, I have the shadows of the characters 
be like so bruce's shadow is always batman harley's shadow is always always harley quinn with the jester suit and the idea of storytelling wise is they just can't outrun their past you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah so, i mean with, with this piece it, maybe it's the scan it, it, you know i don't see a lot of uh, mid-tones in it is that yeah, that's adjusted. So this is finished, uh, ready to be colored. The stuff you Got were looking it. at before were, was raw scan. So actually, it's easier for me to look at this stuff because it's how it was intended. Right. But I know buyers prefer that chalky, uh, you know, gray yeah. stuff. Yeah, well, that's why that's why I was curious. I figured it, that, that you kind of pumped it up to make it look like this. But all right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so after the fight, uh, I can't remember what happens. It's unresolved. And this is a silent panel of bruce feeling the stress of everything that's going wrong uh so he walks out of this is a house that he has that's one of like a dozen safe houses that batman has so he walks out and he um the 89 batmobile makes an appearance in this book too he crawls into yeah. the uh, flying batmobile and he's just having a moment for himself and then you can zoom in you see ace the bat hound kind of nuzzling up from under his arm and i can't decide if i want this to be a silent panel or to have the, give the dog a little sound effect or like just write the word nuzzle in a really cute way or something. I don't know. <laughs> right. I was going to have Bruce actually shedding a tear and I finished this and I'm like, I don't think he needs it. I don't think readers need to see Batman literally cry because it turns into a Tom King book. So let's just have the shadows and the weight of his shoulders do the storytelling for it. He doesn't need to actually have a tear. I think right. it was the, the right decision. And then the dog uh, being adorable under his arm it sort of helps uh offset the, the seriousness of the mood sure sure i mean he seems pretty broken at that at that point you don't need to just out man you know he likes harley he woke up with in bed with her he didn't choose to go to bed with her jack took over his body he's got a <laughs> losing the faith of all the robins gotham's being torn apart i mean how much can bruce take in this book right 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 you're putting him <laughs> through hell <laughs> yeah. oh in the uh side note a little easter egg his um, steering wheel for the ship is a direct ripoff of uh, Knight Rider. Oh, is it really? Yeah, that's literally what uh, Michael Knight drives, that, that shape of that steering wheel. And we have better shots of it in other places. So uh, I don't know how many Knight Rider fans read Batman, but there you go. I, you know, I didn't watch Knight Rider, uh, when, at least when it was when it was coming out. And I could have, but uh, yeah. I did see a, see a few episodes uh, after the yeah. fact. But yeah, I see it. Right. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been rewatching it. It's not a great show, but David Hasselhoff does his best to sell it. I'll, I'll give mm -hmm. him credit. Now there's a tall guy, David Hasselhoff. Have you ever, have you ever oh met yeah, him in he he yeah he's like six six or something. He's gigantic. Wow. But... He's like Tim Towns in height. He could pick yes. anyone up by their nipples. <laughs> exactly, and he <laughs> probably has. Uh, <laughs> oh man, so let's see what do we got. This is like page twelve from the book too. Yeah, this is a uh, Bruce confronting Dick um dick's getting emotional i forget what bruce is saying to him um yeah uh, it's talking a lot of board balloons in panel four but i also saw a good excuse to draw a car so i went with it of course i figured out yeah, dick's cool he's a cool dad uh so he would drive a cool suv and then you've got bruce kind of swinging away and i wanted to have a dramatic shot of a city but i realized how the hell did dick get his suv so far up <laughs> over the skyline <laughs> and he just picked up his kid from preschool so his kid is in that car so this preschool is located 90 stories above the city but whatever i got a cool batman shot out of it but in right. hindsight i might have rethought that last pan a little bit <laughs> yeah because you know it looks like they're in an alley right there and now that but no they're right. not in an alley at all it's a they're... raised alley bill <laughs> all right yes uh I, I won't question it no you're right i i'm calling bullshit on myself it's okay well, yeah, what else could you have done there? But you did get the this great money shot at the end. So it's all about the money shot. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, oh yeah. So a um, bit of an homage here. That's great. That that page I showed you where Bruce is uh shooting the grappling hook towards Dick. This is yeah. the page after. So we've got the homage to Dark Knight, um, mm -hmm. running with the shadow themes and all that. Um, I also got the building from Batman Beyond in the background that that pyramid thing is uh always fun to play with. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty flat composition, but I tried to angle Bruce away from us. So like the depth of the piece comes from the fact that his legs are closer to us than his, than his head is. And of course, the depth of the city helps a lot too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. But yeah, I've been having fun like playing with like uh, sci-fi highways, 
like spaghetti throughout the city. And I found a system of doing it that's pretty effective and doesn't take as long as you think it would. I don't know. I, I, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't do that. But, but like you said, if you have a system, you've been doing it long enough, you've kind of, you, you've got your own thing for that, but uh, wow. yeah, it gets to be a thing where every city starts to look like a sci-fi city. Cause it just looks like my style now. And I haven't actually looked at a drawing uh, of a photo of a city for a while. Mm -hmm. So I worry that I'm leaning on um, my tricks and not actually researching enough, but I got enough to do with this book, but doing writing all the other stuff too, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I have to ask, are you already thinking about the next project? Oh yeah. 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 I got, uh, I can tell the, the big spoiler at the end of this book, people want to click off again. <laughs> uh, don't, don't, don't do it. Don't, I don't, don't, I, don't right, do it. Right. Don't do it. Okay. Um, so this is the last now when we have another one, you know, never another show we, we can talk <laughs> about this. So, um, this is the last issue, uh, sorry, page of the issue. And, uh, Dick has just been hit pretty bad by, uh, Derek powers. And, um, this is the, like, is he dead? Is he not type thing? And I've killed off so many characters in white Knight that Dick could very well be dead here. And I started out as a, uh, Jason Todd homage where I had the figures facing the camera and that classic pose of Batman holding Robin. Yeah. Um, and I even did a layout for it, which I can show you. I ended up not using it just because I feel like composition didn't look as good. There it is. So originally it was supposed to be the classic. Sure. Oh yeah. With um, powers in the background, and you know that does work. Uh, the difference is that. Uh, Dick is a full-grown man, whereas uh, in the original page, Robin was a lot smaller. So Batman's size allowed him to cradle Dick a lot. Uh, this is coming out. The, sorry, I'm getting mixed up over my words here. So rather than do a straight homage, I felt like a better composition would be to like turn the figures so the camera, you or I would come from this side and go past them, and it would sort of frame powers at the same time. And I feel like this is a little bit better of a pose where um uh dick is being uh sort of framed by bruce and by blacking out his face it just adds more um emphasis onto dick's face and then having these dramatic shadows here um and then offsetting that with the smoke coming from powers and from uh robin's chest it's just sort of a lot of different design tricks i was playing with here and uh i think i get in hindsight i guess both of them work but this one just feels a lot flatter to me even though it's more of an homage Whereas that one just feels like a better illustration. And that's what I ended up going with. Right. So it's yeah. interesting that, you know, compare that to the, uh, the DPS you showed us earlier, where originally you had drawn them coming straight at the, at the camera and you, you, you yeah. kind of flipped it out to a different angle just, just because it had a, it was a little bit more dynamic. Um, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think that's, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. No, that's, it, it's a great image. And I'm glad we got no spoilers out there. I think we would have had some people mad at us. So, okay, yeah, I'll, I'm bad. I'm mad. I don't mind spoiling stuff, uh, but I know people aren't always ready for it, and I'm not good at giving a proper warning. So, right. Well, this yeah. is uh, this. Yeah, this is this is great. It really is, man. If I wish people so, could see the, you know, because I get to see the full uh, high res piece here on my screen, so that you know, that's yeah. hopefully people are watching these on larger. We we have people who watch it on their TV, so they get to see really nice images. There you go. Yeah. Nice. So I got a question here. Someone's asking me to do a Punisher comic. I would love that. Uh, I don't know if DC is doing Punisher right now, just because of the quote unquote problematic nature of. Uh, punisher fans or people that wear the white skull or cops that wear the white skull <laughs> um but it's ridiculous because that mm -hmm. symbol is worth millions of dollars every year when they license it out to t-shirts and shit so like marvel's making a killing on that symbol as they should because it's a cool symbol as right. far as the future of uh punisher books i don't know if we're going to get a classic punisher until you know the culture war dies down a bit no well, that's probably Sorry. true Never thought about it like that, but it's yeah, of course it's a financial yeah. decision and also a, uh, I guess a uh, I don't want to say it's a moral decision, but it's it's there's there's a lot at play when yeah. uh, people are thinking about what they want to publish today. Yeah, yeah. A lot of oh yeah, they changed the uh, Punisher symbol to more like a Asian um, symbol. I forget what it is. It's like a devil type thing. Um. Yeah, do one without the skull. There you go. But it's still Punisher, and he's still killing people, and he's still glorifying violence. I don't know, whatever. Right. I got no problem with it. I, I wish that 
Marvel would stop giving a shit and just put out Punisher books again and just shot, sh turn Twitter off and stop listening to people and just enjoy your sales, you know? Right. Well, they're owned by Disney now and it's, there's a lot more at stake or at play probably in their decision-making than yeah. uh, in the days of old. Yeah. So, uh, so Sean, I, I mean, now, so you got to go, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to keep you longer than uh, you were planning on saying, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we should do We got to do this every six months. We should just make it, make it a, a schedule on this. Cause I think, you know, that first part of the conversation, just talking about the hobby and, uh, and yeah. And, and I mean, I, I got to learn that you did that auction. I mean, how cool is that? I think that that's, yeah. that's totally amazing. And I think we need yeah. more of that. I've been, I've been preaching the idea that we have to find new ways to, to get together and mm -hmm. more ways. Like, uh, like you mentioned mm -hmm. potential get together that's going to happen at New York Comic Con, those sorts of things. I, I yep. really feel like we as collectors need to kind of create our own opportunities like those to get people together to, you know, whether it's to buy and sell art or just look at everybody else's collection. You know, yeah. we need to have more of those kind of get togethers out there. And uh, and heck, if you can get a guy like yourself to partake in it as well, it just makes it yeah. even more fun. Yeah. So uh, I won't spoil it here, but one of the buyers here uh or someone we all know is going to be doing an event in uh new york comic-con i plan on being there and it's not an auction that highlights my stuff it's just a, a hangout i will be bringing art with me um i can sell it but that's not the reason why i'm going um mostly i'm just excited to see this person's uh house and uh their art collection that they have so uh yeah i hope that a lot of people are there and yeah i totally support doing this kind of stuff I mean, I actually prefer hanging out with uh, you people than with comic book pros sometimes. <laughs> I find that uh, there's a lot more normies here than there are in uh, the Marvel DC parties. Um, there you go. Yeah. See, here I, I, I complain I, about different. the lack of Punisher books. If I'm at a Marvel party, I can't start saying that shit. People will try to cancel me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I get it. But um, yeah. Well, anyway, what are you going to do? But I, but I, but I do, I think, so I think that's great. And uh, yeah, I think that the idea that you're thinking outside of the box from your marketing, and we talked about this again, you know, six months ago, I think more, more creators should be thinking like that, you know, create your own opportunities, not don't, don't sit back and wait for somebody else to kind of do it for you. Yeah. You know, I think uh, you, you definitely got the right uh, idea on most of that stuff. Thanks. Oh, Everybody's screaming I look, Punisher, though. I look like uh, Viggo Mortensen. Thank you. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> it's because he barely has eyebrows, and neither barely I barely have eyebrows too. I guess. Uh, yeah, that, there you go. Uh, design a Punisher with a Mickey Mouse skull on his chest, and that'd go be good. Him. That would be that would wake Marvel up. I'm mean, honestly, if you did that, they would have the re re opposite reaction of that. I bet their suits would be like. I don't know if they know what to do with Punisher as it is. <laughs> right. Right. Well, come on. They got, you know, well, whatever. I'm not going to, we've gotten a lot of good things out of Marvel since uh, Disney picked them up. I, I, you know, so I can't complain. But, hey, uh, uh, question is, is uh, Star Wars back at Dark Horse now? Or is Marvel not doing that anymore? You know, I don't know about that. Uh, okay. I have to look into that. I, I don't know. Somebody right. in the audience will probably know. There's a, there's a few people with, uh, who are much more into I saw that. A, sp a Star Wars cover that was great. And uh, I saw a Dark Horse label on it, and I, hmm. I'm sure I, I could have just looked it up, and I'm lazy. Uh, if they gave it back completely to Dark Horse, or if Dark Horse is just doing um, a side series, and Marvel still has their Darth Vader books or whatever, I don't, I don't know. Hmm. No, I'll look into. I, I have no idea. Yeah, it's okay. This is this is an art channel. We're not here to talk about comics. <laughs> oh man. Well. Um... Well, next time I'll remember to leave uh, Jeff's uh, name off the uh, the intros if um, uh, if Jeff I'll ask Jeff if he's going to attend next time. I think, but this yeah this worked out pretty good though. And you know what? I, the only thing I wanted to ask you was, have you made any new models before you go? Have you done any more <laughs> of the? You know, like, I forget we showed us the last time. Maybe one of the cars or something. But Just have you worked the, uh, on anything like that? Here's the tank for. Uh, uh, I think I showed uh, you this one. Yeah, yes. this is the police tank with a complete with a rotating turret. That's awesome. and uh, I don't have anything new, but I'll. Ugh, where is it? Here, here's the uh, the flying Batmobile. I don't know if I'd ever sell this. I mean, it took me a week to put this together. Oh my gosh! So yeah, but it's been really it's been coming in handy a lot too. Just the, this thing changes shape by different angles. You know, suddenly the fenders get really close, and then right. it looks totally different. You know, it's it's really handy having stuff like this. You know, Oop, I would hold that. on that onto that for a while, man. Yeah, maybe when I'm 80, this can be one of the, uh, I have cancer, I need money, time to sell artwork pages or sell models. 
Well, I think artists that use reference like that is cool. I mean, David Peterson, I remember with, with Mouse Guard, he he would create like his, uh, you know, the chapels or the sit the scenes out of like cardboard cutouts just oh, so he cool. would have an idea of what he wanted. Yeah. And he did it a lot. And I thought, I was like, man, that's that's really creative. I mean, you know, rather yeah. than, because there's so many different ways you could do it now. You could 3D render it and just keep looking yeah. at it on your computer. Or you could just look for photo reference from, from a, a church somewhere, but he literally would build his places and wow. then use, use, use that as his reference point. So, and tell me he's not going to D and D with that shit after. All uh, right. He's doing some Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Bill, uh, listen, if you do yeah. New York uh, and if I see you at that gathering thing, it'd be good to see you. If not, I'll see you some other time. But... Yeah, I'll let you know. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to feel like maybe I should try to – maybe I don't go to the con, but I do a couple of the after after events or something like that. I'll, yeah. I'll okay. You're, yeah. You, you've almost convinced me. I think I might have to do it. <laughs> I'm definitely going. I, I got to see his place, and he's a good guy. All right, cool. Well, listen, uh, you are a good guy as well, Sean. So Thanks, we'll – uh, I'll talk with Jeff after the show. Maybe we can just set something up for March again or some or that time frame. Maybe um, whatever project you're working on next, whenever we kind of get to the yeah you know, revealed and we can talk about it more and show off some of the artwork. Yeah. Maybe you know, just plan it around that. Yeah, sure. In March I'll be done, Batman. Um I'll be starting a Zorro book that I'm writing a drawing. Oh, cool. Uh, which hasn't officially been announced yet, but I'll have some Zorro stuff. Um that stuff won't be priced like Batman. It'll be a lot less expensive. So for people that are waiting for stuff that's more affordable, then maybe uh, hang hang out until the spring. Um, but yeah, I'd love to do this again. Every time I talk to you, I always get a boost in art sales. So it's a good reason to chat you up, even hey, if I'm, yeah. I'm good for something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, man, it's, it's always fun. And uh, I hope I do get to see it in New York. And uh, if I don't, then we'll just plan on seeing each other later this year or early in the new year. Cool, man. All right. Take care. Stay All out right. of the hot weather.